This is the wonderful Dr. Josh Stripling. So he did internal medicine here at UAB, was a chief resident, went off to Harvard to do an IV fellowship and is now back and has graciously given us some time to kind of educate our service. He works with us on the ID co-management. So we're here to talk about antibiotic stewardship and Josh, you can go ahead and take it away. All right, I will. Um, so thank you all for having me and allowing me to talk about this. Uh, this is a little bit of a slide that I prepared that I, I give to the medical students and that I've given to the ID fellows. And as I kind of went through and looked at it a little bit more, I probably should be giving this to the ID attendings as well. It's quite simple. Um, I'm not gonna blow anybody's mind with this one, but it really just gives us a kind of a framework to the way that I approach uh, antibiotics and maybe one that we should all kind of use to approach antibiotics. Uh, hopefully a little bit of fun in here as well. Um, and then also a little bit of information and data as we go along. So um, I'm not gonna cover everything obviously in infectious diseases and everything in stewardship, but hopefully this will give us a baseline of discussion as we move forward. And, and hopefully as you invite me some, for some additional talks in the future. Um, so I have no pertinent disclosures to discuss. I'm an ID attending, so we don't make very much money. Um, I'm glad to uh, accept any disclosures uh, if you'd like to provide. Um, Outline-wise, we're gonna talk about four moments in antibiotic prescribing. Is there an infection, obtaining cultures, de-escalation, and the ultimate question, duration. A little bit about thoughtful empirics, and then towards the end, resistance and the post-antibiotic world that we live in. Bacteria have numbers, but you have brains, and potentially we can defeat that. The objectives, we're gonna look at this mental framework. We're gonna review some empiric antibiotics, a little bit of general on drug resistance, and then hopefully uh, feel a little bit better about prescribing antibiotics. Uh, again, this was geared towards the medical students who are going into their intern year, so that needed to be edited, which I hope that it was, but it wasn't. Um, so four moments in antibiotic thinking. This is a paper that actually just came out uh, by Tama and, the, uh, and JAMA not too long ago. And it goes over four key points. And I think there are four key points that those of us who don't see very many patients, those of us who see patients every day, like y'all, those of us who've been practicing for 40 years, if you actually go back and look at the way you make these decisions, I think this sets a pretty good framework for us. Um, so these are gonna be the first moments. But first, I have something for you. Oh, skip the head. One moment. The following is a paid program brought to you by Ronco. This Showtime rotisserie and barbecue is now priced under a hundred dollars. That's right, it's now under a hundred dollars. Order it in black or order it in white. Then you can make a delicious six pound chicken. Not one, but two delicious rotisserie chickens. A scrumptious, flavorful six and a half pound standing rib roast. A dozen tasty, juicy lamb chops. A six and a half pound caramelized honey ham. Three extra thick, healthy salmon steaks. A six pound mouth watering pork loin roast. A tender, flavorful Texas style tri tip. Eight full size beef and chicken kebabs. A big 10 pound golden brown turkey enough hot dogs and sausages to feed a small army a luscious looking six pound leg of lamb with rosemary four freshly caught whole trout four half pound juicy hamburgers three naturally flavored rock cornish game heads and everybody's favorite baby back ribs set it and forget it set it and forget it you just set it and forget it you just set it and you forget about it you just set it and then forget it. You just set it and forget it. Set it and forget about it. You set it and forget it. And of course, we are talking about the Showtime rotisserie and barbecue. And let me introduce the inventor himself, Ron Popeil. So the point there is don't be like Ron Popeil. Don't set it and forget it. That's not what we're, what we're looking for with antibiotics at this point in time. So yeah, it's funny. You get to see a bunch of rota rotating meat, but I think you'll remember, don't set it and forget it. Um, so we'll go with our first case, Mr. SOB. And again, we wrote, wrote this maybe a, a couple, a year ago at this point in time. And this obviously has only gotten more uh, 
more likely at this point. So a middle-aged man, increased shortness of breath, subjective fevers, rhinorrhea, dry cough, lower extremity edema. He's got a recent hospitalization, had some RMRSA pneumonia, or at least a bunch of cultures that uh, grew MRSA. VRP is positive for rhinovirus. He's got edema. He's got everything else. This is what his chest x-ray looks like. And then the ultimate question, well, what does Mr. SOB have, right? Does he have an MRSA pneumonia again? There's just COPD, heart failure exacerbation, pulmonary edema, viral, all these things that go through our mind all the time. Now we get to add COVID into this. And then the question is, well, is it all of these things? Is it some of these things? Is it none of these things? And that brings us to moment number one. Does this patient have an infection that requires antibiotics? And this is the ultimate first question, and one often that I think y'all don't really get to make every time, right? They came from the ED, they've already been labeled as such, you're just continuing what they go through until the attending picks up the next day or somebody comes on and consults and tells you what's going on. But this is moment number one, right? Do they have an infection? Then importantly, what is that infectious syndrome? And when we talk about an infectious syndrome, we're talking about, is this a pneumonia? Is this meningitis? Is this a urinary tract infection? Is this an intra-abdominal infection? Is this somewhere where I can start to localize these infections? And when they do, you know, you can start to make those decisions about the next couple of moments that we're going to talk about. But that's really the first question. I'll also point out that an isolated fever, an isolated leukocytosis, somebody with altered mental status, or hey, the radiologist said this CT looks like this, is not classically specific for infection, right? You really have to put all these things together to figure out that syndrome. Then the other part is, what are the possible non-infectious explanations within this? Is this possibly a non-infectious diagnosis? So one that we're always balancing, right? Is this this thing that we need to give antibiotics for, and then what is that syndrome? Or is this something else that maybe I don't need to give antibiotics for? And you may really, I mean, we do this all the time, but it, it really begs to kind of slow down a moment and say, well, what am I actually treating? And I think oftentimes on consults, um, we'll see these people that have multitudes of antibiotics and you know all this smattering, they've been seen by 25 different people and you know they say, well, what antibiotics do we need to do? And then initially the first question is, well, what are we treating, right? And I think if we start at that space, then it's a lot easier to know about what to do in the next couple of moments. Um, and also easier sometimes to say, you know what? This isn't an infection. We can just move on down the line with looking at our non-infectious realities. The other thing within this moment uh, that you also have to consider too, which makes this job a little bit more complex, is you have to consider the host, right? What are those comorbidities that could lead to the infectious or non-infectious concerns? What are the recent treatments that they had? Do I need to be thinking about resistance? And then also, are they immunocompromised? Could they have a disease that's kind of presenting a little abnormally because of that? Or is it gonna be a delayed presentation with more issues? And then obviously, how sick is the patient, right? What is the risk of delay? If I make this decision tomorrow, if I make this decision in 48 hours, if I defer this decision and make it as an outpatient, what's the risk within that, right? So I think we're balancing all of these things together in this one moment, but it all comes back to that point. Does this person require antibiotics? This is one of those sections where uh, on co-management, we see this a lot. Uh, we see this a lot in our clinics as well. Um, but this is where, does this person need antibiotics to me? So on the left side of this with the chart, this is the prevalence of asymptomatic bacteria reported in different populations. So um, obviously culture positive asymptomatic bacteria, they don't have symptoms, that's the definition, but they have a positive culture. And if you look down entire individuals with indwelling catheters, which y'all have seen a million of them, long-term 100%, short-term catheter increase from there. And then you look at the smattering between women, intermittent catheter use, it's all really high. Um, so remember, just because you have a positive culture doesn't mean they have the syndrome that you're looking for, and especially in asymptomatic bacteria, you can see that. And the other one on the side is just a little small snippet of uh, recommendation uh, that comes out of the guideline from the IDSA for the management of UTIs. And this is in individuals who have asymptomatic bacteria, these older folks who are way up in the risk of elderly, um, talking about 20% prevalence within this, um, where if they come in with delirium without any localizing signs of GU symptoms, there is no recommendation for treatment of that bacteria and that you should look for alternative possible causes to dementia. 
This is right out of the guidelines for the management of urinary tract infections. Now, there is a whole nother talk that I could give you based on this specifically. So we'll leave it at that to say a lot of people have positive cultures and not everybody who comes in confused has a urinary tract infection. Now, some do, but not all of them. Um, we'll move on next to question number two. So you got Mr. SOB that we saw before with the bilateral pneumonia and the positive rhinovirus and then maybe some other smattering of everything else. So what are you going to do, right? Start vancomycin, vancencephapine because it came out of the ED and it started, linezolid because he got vanc before and why not use a nice PO agent? Nothing, that's probably my opinion. Send some sputum cultures and viral respiratory panel, a pro-cal because heck, I don't know, maybe that'll help. Call an upper level, call a whoever, uh, call the ID consult or you could really do something else, right? So that brings us to moment two. Have I ordered the appropriate cultures before starting antibiotics? This is my biggest thing in ID. Culture negative infections are incredibly hard to treat. I don't know if they're infections or not, and if they are, I have no idea what they are. But culture positive infections are much easier. Make your life easier, get the cultures. You call us and you say, hey, this is MRSA. I say, cool, I can manage that. You call us and say, hey, I got this guy who's had fevers for three days, uh, leukocytosis, um, you know, surgery seen him four or five times, they've taken an OR, never drew a culture. How long do I need to treat this guy, right? I, I have no idea. Um, so the idea here is to get the cultures from there. The other point, and this is what often is said is, well, I didn't have time to get cultures. I didn't have time to order that. And you're, you're right. Sometimes severity of illness requires us to start broad therapy with no time of delay in between. And I completely buy that. But you can still consider the source and obtain those cultures um, after that for appropriate diagnostics. Yes, there is gonna be a reduction um, in some of these individuals of the cultures being positive or being valuable for us. And you know that, that's okay. We'll deal with that in these very sick individuals. Um, but at the same time, there has definitely been plenty of studies that have said, you know what, the culture results are still okay too. Um, so, you know, just because you started them on antibiotics empirically doesn't mean I shouldn't get my cultures and you should definitely consider your cultures before you start it. Mr. SOB, again, the VRP returned positive for pair flu. His wife had the cold three days ago. He had a low pro cow. He improved to four liters of nasal cannula um, with some mild respiratory distress and uh, some, of course, breath sounds. So the next question, with new clinical data, what are you going to do for Mr. SOB? Well, I now have a diagnosis. He's not 100% better, but he's looking okay. I'm gonna continue the vanc and cefepine. This guy's still a little sick. He's on four liters. I'm gonna switch to vanc and nezlet. I'm gonna change whatever I can do. Call an ID consult. Maybe I'll get a sputum culture now. What should I do, right? So this is moment number three. A day or more has passed. Can I stop antibiotics? Can I narrow therapy? Or can I switch from IV to PL? you obtain great cultures, use them, right? Positive or negative. Positive cultures are very helpful. They allow you to know if you can de-escalate uh, to other things, what you're treating, how long you need to treat it, but also negative cultures are valuable too. Sometimes when there's not an infection, the cultures are negative and we should treat them as such from that standpoint. If the diagnostics suggest an alternative, don't be afraid to stop treatment. I always find it fascinating with antibiotics is they're the one thing that we really do not want to pull off, right? You have a patient who presents with hypoxemia and pleuritic chest pain, D-dimer's negative, his CTA's negative. You started him on heparin in the ED because you were super worried about it. Well, once you get all this result back, do you stop the heparin or you just say, well, you know what? When he came in, I was very concerned about him potentially having a PE. I'm going to keep going. That doesn't happen uh, with antibiotics very frequently. You have someone who presents and it said, well, you know, I, I, I had some burning when I urinated, right? And then all of a sudden you find out that they have, you know, a stone in place and hematuria and whatever else. We still continue those antibiotics. And I think we need to realize that it's okay to stop them. Perfectly fine. We have an alternative diagnosis. We're going to be all right. They're still in the hospital. And if things don't go in the right direction, I can readdress. It's okay to stop antibiotics when you don't have it. The other point I would also say with this, and I'm sure you've heard many of us say it as well, is IV doesn't always mean it's better. PO antibiotics are just as good as IV in a lot of situations and sometimes are preferable for many, many reasons. I know you all have seen this study before, but just to bring it up again, this is the OVIVA trial that looked at bone and joint infections, so osteomyelitis, osteomyelitis with hardware-related infections. 
and compared the use of IV to PL. These people were treated for a long period of time, so it's not the best study in the world to say what the duration is, but the basic outcome with all this is that it basically favored oral in the majority of these situations over IV. And it was a smattering of oral medications, beta-lactams, fluoroquinolones, uh, Bactrim, all these things, if you put them all together and over this group of treated people, oral is just as good as IV from that. There are some caveats where IV may be necessary, and if you look at Aviva, if there's hardware in place, or if you have a culture negative infection, IV is favored a little bit more within that. But don't forget, your oral antibiotics are your friends, and they are just as good as IV when chosen correctly. Moment number four, and this is the ultimate question ID. What duration of antibiotics is needed for the patient's diagnosis? This, again, I will confess, is not always easy, and honestly, it depends. Where's the site of infection? What's the pathogen that I'm treating? Who's the host that I'm treating this with? What are the smattering of other situations that we're all considering within that? But I will tell you that in almost all studies, randomized, retrospective, whichever way you look at it, all studies have shown that a shorter duration is better. Now you could say, well, that's just because we overtreat everybody, which may be a possibility. Um, but I can really only think of one, and that's otitis media in kids, where they recommended a little bit of a longer course of therapy, but ain't none of us treating any kids. Um, so that's the only space there from that. Uh, trial that I'll bring up within this group is a trial of short course antimicrobial therapy for uh, intra-abdominal infections. This is the bane, uh, I'm sure, of y'all's existence because it also involves that you have to use a bunch of surgeons when you have intra-abdominal infections or IR folks. It's the bane of ours too because they call us just as frequently and say, well, how long do I need to treat this for? And I say, well, y'all put out a study about five years ago that told you exactly how long you were supposed to treat this. This is known as the stop it trial. And what it looked at is people with intra-abdominal infections, abscesses, uh, cholecystitis, things otherwise, who had source control and source control was either operative surgical management or IR drainage, looked at giving them four days from that source control, that period where it was defined, or a prolonged course looking at where they had absence of fever, improvement in leukocytosis, and treating them until that point, which was an average of eight days, there was absolutely no difference in outcomes of those individuals who had successful source control. Four days, versus eight days, and even eight days is short for our group that we see a lot of times, right? So just knowing that a shorter course of duration if you've had source control is great. Now the other point in this trial, um, 18 to 20% in either group had a recurrence of their infection, right? So IV didn't stop recurrence, PO didn't stop recurrence. This is just a question of source control. And if you fail with a shorter duration of therapy, it's not a failure because you chose a shorter duration of therapy. It's a failure because in 18 to 20% of these cases, people just recur. It's just the natural progress of this infection. And I think sometimes that's hard too, um, when the surgeon is staring down your back and saying, I don't wanna see this patient again, treat him for 22 days uh, so that we get outside of some window or whatever else. We're working on an RIR and, and, and hopefully this information will help y'all do the same from there. So this is uh, just the culmination of a couple of studies that have come out. This is Spellberg uh, out of JAMA back in 2016. And basically looks at this idea. For community-acquired pneumonia, we now know that five days is as good as the seven days that we did before. Nosocomial pneumonias, seven days. HCAP therapy, seven days. BAP, seven days. We don't need the 14 days anymore. Pyelonephritis, depending on the agent that you have, five to seven days. We don't need 10 to 14 days for everybody with antibiotics. Intra-abdominal infections, we talked about four to 10. Acute exacerbations of COPD, less than five. Sinusitis, five. Cellulitis, another one that y'all see quite frequently. Five days is probably effective therapy within a lot of these people with cellulitis. That doesn't mean the erythema is going to be gone. Sometimes that takes a little bit of time. Um, but five days is, is sufficient there. And then chronic osteo, as we talked about, um, with the Aviva trials there, um, have a shorter duration within that group on some caveats if they've had source control and things otherwise. So again, shorter duration within that group is going to be better there. So thinking about antibiotics, right, here's our four things here. Does this person have an infection that requires antibiotics? Yes, no. Could this be an infectious syndrome? Possibly. Have I ordered appropriate cultures? Remember, culture negative infection is incredibly hard to treat. Positive, a heck of a lot easier. 
has a day pass where I could change IV to PO, or could I just stop antibiotics at this point in time? And then four, I've identified my infectious syndrome. I have my cultures that are helping me out. I've de-escalated. How long do I need to treat this? And the answer there, shorter is going to be better from that standpoint. So remember our friend, Ron Pompeo, don't set it and forget it. Antibiotics are not like that. They're not the rotisserie oven. Um, they are uh, have some limits, and we'll talk about that a little bit. So empiric antibiotics, this is just brief. Um, so the infectious syndromes, right, they are numerous. Meningitis, encephalitis, pharyngitis, otitis, URIs, pneumonia, and pyema endocarditis. But if I can define within this syndrome, right, then I can start to figure out where I need to take my cultures and then what I need to do from there. So in empirics within this course, how are you going to choose, right? You have a patient present, you suspect a diagnosis of an infectious syndrome, you say, man, this feels like I need to get an LP and I'm gonna call uh, my friendly procedure service and ask them for that LP tonight. And then I'm going to think about what could that potentially be? Is this a bacterial process, a viral process? And then I'm gonna put those best antibiotics on. Or is it gonna be like the ED? Patient presents, whoop, sick. Vengenzosin, let's move on down the road, admit them to hospitals, they can figure it out later on down. Um, sometimes that happens, right? So we want to be the, the type A folks. We don't want to be the type B folks from that standpoint. So some of my choice thoughts, right, when we talk about empirics, if I can only be one antibiotic, what would I be? If I'm an IV guy, I'm going ceftriaxone. This thing is the jam. Uh, now, ceftriaxone, I know for a lot of people, is it one gram versus two grams, or is it two grams Q12? I used to try to be like this incredible ID doctor who could knew exactly when one gram was necessary or when two grams was necessary. I, I'm gonna confess, I really don't know. Um, I know one gram will work for some people, but trying to decide between the one or two is like, well, it was only a partial centimeter close to the bone, so I think I can go for one or ooh, two centimeters into the bone. That's a two gram septriaxone. Two grams all the time, just two grams. Just remember it, two grams. And then if it goes into the brain, then it's two grams twice a day, right? Makes things a little bit easier for me. Um, one gram, who cares? Just throw it out. It is actually in your uh, pneumonia guidelines for uh, one gram, uh, which we'll fix eventually. It needs to be two grams. And if I'm a PO agent, I'm going to go with Bactrim. I got MRSA. I got gram negatives. Uh, I have excellent oral bioavailability. I get into the soft tissues. I can be used empirically to treat urinary tract infections. Just a great drug. Um, so I keep that in my armament all the time. And if I can either get to those two antibiotics with my decisions, I'm going to be a happy guy. Um, what about specific pathogen concerns? Um, there are many, many things that we could talk about here in one lecture, can't do it justice. So uh, if this works for you, I would love to talk to you about some more of those specific pathogens if we need to, or some of those specific syndromes too. Um, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end to kind of talk about uh, some questions or some of those things there as well. So gram positives, strep species, we're talking about our penicillins, our cephalosporins, uh, cefazolin first generations or ceftriaxone, and then our good friend the linezolid, incredible strep coverage with all of those as well. I don't need to think about everything else. This is a streptococcal cellulitis. Uh, let's just go with one of these agents. I think you've probably seen us a lot uh, on co-management. Somebody's on bank and we'll say, stop that bank, just give them cefazolin, we're done. Um, MSSA, we talk about our anti-staphylococcal penicillins, NAF and OX, and then our first generation cephalosporins, best drugs for MSSA within that. Nafcillin versus cefazolin uh, is an interesting question. If you have a really high uh, burden of bacteria, I usually swing over to the nafcillin. If I'm worried about side effects and things otherwise, I usually swing over to the first generation cephalosporin. MRSA treatments cover are MSSA, but those anti-staphylococcal penicillins and first-generation cephalosporins are obviously better. MRSA, we got Bank, we got Dapto, Linezolid, and Ceftaroline. All of y'all are very familiar with these agents as well. Um, a short push on vancomycin. We are hopefully moving away from troughs. It's probably going to take us a year to get there, um, but we're going to move to this really cool um, Bayesian modeling system that looks at AUC over MIC where we can actually tell you if the level uh, of vancomycin outside of that trough range uh, is going to be effective for that patient. So when you get a trough of eight, is that still gonna be okay? Or in some of these individuals where you're never gonna get there, we're gonna be able to switch to those alternative therapies much faster. It's coming, maybe Highlands first, 
um, but really a cool future for MRSA treatment with vancomycin. Um, so uh, really looking forward to that. Uh, enterococcus, the amino penicillins, and our penicillin, uh, penicillins, uh, amino penicillins are amoxin amp, uh, daptomycin and the linezolid within that. I often ask the question, what is the best treatment for VRE? The answer to that is ampicillin if it's susceptible. Um, and oftentimes you will see a lot of these isolates that are VRE that are still maintaining ampicillin susceptibility and that should be chosen above the other ones within that. Gram negatives, enterics, or you may see uh, the word enterobacteriaceae as you're looking across uh, some of these studies. You got your cephalosporins moving into your generations of second and third generation there, fourth generation with cefepime. Uh, beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors, our aminoglycosides, they're coming in hot and fast. We haven't used them for a, a couple years, so their uh, susceptibility rate is starting to climb. I absolutely, absolutely love gentamicin uh, for urinary tract infections for individuals who have uh, normal creatinine. Um, it's going to work for about everything. Um, so you may see me uh, come around for that, and it is probably coming uh, into kind of um, the lay press uh, and outside of the ID world in the next uh, couple of months to year as well. Fluoroquinolone is always great as trianam for those individuals who um, have antibiotic allergies. We can talk a little bit about antibiotic allergies in the future. Hopefully we're moving in a good direction there for UAB as well. And then carbapenems uh, for the end game play. Uh, Pseudomonas, you got ceftaz, cefepime, zosin, aminoglycosides again within that. Fluoroquinolones, not moxie astrianam, and then carbapenems, not erda. Um, so that's the way we think about pseudomonas. We treat a whole lot of people for pseudomonas coverage, um, and our rates of pseudomonas infection in the majority of our patients are incredibly low, less than 5% of our hospitalized population, but far greater than that get anti-pseudomonal uh, agents within that. So I think it's another space where we could look for some improvement. Now, we do have resistance that's growing. So maybe instead of saying we're going to give anti-pseudomonal coverage, we're going to give MDRO coverage, which is a true reality in the world that we live in. So others are anaerobic friends, metronidazole, clinda, zosin, moxie, all good anaerobic coverage. Also vancomycin and linezolid have good anaerobic coverage too, but I'm not going to blow your minds with that right now. I'll blow them later. Um, I will also say you don't need to double cover anaerobes, and I don't know where this came around. Uh, at some point, somebody said that. If you got them on Zosin, you don't need to add the flagell. If you have them on flagell, you don't need to add Clinda just because it's above the diaphragm. There are some really funny things that we learned in medical school that seem to always stick. Uh, and clindamycin with the wind, has it sticks for everybody. I don't understand uh, why some things do, but some, some things just do. Uh, atypical infections, azithromycin, great legionella drug, doxy in these individuals with people with uh, prolonged QTCs and other issues, and then fluoroquinolones, obviously, within that too. All great atypical coverage for community acquired pneumonias and other things as well. Candida infections, mycofungin and fluconazole, mold infections, ampho B and BORI, and then viral infections, acyclovir and GAN cyclovir from that standpoint. And then, how do you really know about all this stuff? Location, location, location. And these are our antibiograms that we have at our institution. I'm going to give you a little resource that hopefully some of you already know, um, but hopefully more will after this um, to help you out with these antibiograms. So remember, don't set it and forget it. It's not going to help you out. Um, again, just a small point on resistance. We could talk about four or five other lectures to kind of get through all of this at this point in time. Uh, resistance is fast. Bacteria have numbers. I mean, you're talking about hundreds of millions of these things that grow in some of the, our patients that are infected. Um, once, all it takes is one, right? One develops the right gene, one has the right mutation, you put the right pressure on someone, and then all of a sudden you have all of these bacteria that are then resistant. So if you look at penicillins that came out in 1928, 1940, we got resistance. Tetracyclines, the 40s, 50s, we got resistance. Carbapenems come out in 85, we got resistance in 93. It's not going to be new agents that are going to slow this resistance down, right? We can pull up plazomycin, we can get cefiterocol, we can throw out ceftazavi or ceftotazo. They're great. They're awesome drugs when we need to use them. But if we use them indiscriminately, we end up with the same thing in the resistance and we're back at the same problem. So back to our four moments in antibiotic prescribing, it's really going to help us out in the future with that. So when to consider resistance? 
cultures are the only way to prove resistance, right? We're talking about genotypes and phenotypes, which one matters, which one's the best. Really, it's the phenotype, and that's what you see with your culture of S, I, and R, or S, S, D, D, and R. We're looking at phenotypic results within that. PCR are looking at the genotype can definitely assist us and provide some help, sometimes a little bit faster than our phenotypic results. Some other cool things that are coming that way as well uh, through UAB. Hopefully when that, that hits, you'll have some more information to know what to do about it, but we'll be around to help you out. Escape bacteria, I'm sure you all have heard about this. This is a kind of a good nomenclature to think about. If I see these pathogens, I should kind of maybe think about resistance. I don't need to act but there could be some resistance there. These are Ephesium or our VRE, much likely than our Fecalis, MRSA, which you're all familiar with, Cleb Pneumo, the same way, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, and then Enterobacter. These pathogens, they are not inclusive of everything, but ESCAPE gives us all of these and gives us an idea of, to think about when do I need to consider resistance. AMP seed producers. This one is another one of those things that people learn about, and for some reason, it just sticks. People love to talk about AMPC. Um, you know, I can't get you to talk about uh, a VIM or a CRE or, you know, a metallobeta-lactamase, um, but my God, you'll say, ooh, this is an AMPC bug. Should I add a carbapenem here? Uh, and the answer is, ah, it depends, right? Um, but it is awesome that you think about this as well. So AMPC, they're actually chromosomally mediated beta-lactamase. And there are certain bacteria that carry these things around. And they're actually, it's a really cool process by which that they kind of produce these things. And actually they produce them all the time, but genes or proteins for bacteria are very costly, right? You have to have all your resources and everything else. So what they do is they actually make a repressor. So they repress that gene production within that. So when you have, you use zosin or other things, the little parts cleave that, stick to the repressor, and then they unbind and that gene is produced within that, that protein. It's really cool. So you can get stably derepressed stuff and all these other things, any beyond this talk. Um, but AMPC occurs in certain organisms and the way to remember that is space. This is not all AMPC producers. And if you wanna learn about uh, some crazy stuff, I'll print you a list for AMPC producers and it's about a thousand different uh, microorganisms. The big one with space though are ser serratia species, or if you're one of those centimeter fans, you can call them serratia. Um, also indole positive proteus. This one happens all the time. How many times have y'all seen proteus mirabilis on a urine culture? It is the third most common cause, gram negative cause of urinary tract infections, proteus mirabilis. Thank goodness it is not an AMC producer because we would be in trouble. Um, it is only the indole positive proteus, which is Proteus vulgaris that carries AMPC within that. Acinetobacter is another one, Citrobacter and Enterobacter. The way I remember it is Serratia, Proteus, and no positive, and three bad actors Acinetobacter, Citrobacter, and Enterobacter. Enterobacter is the one that, on, that, the one that bothers me the most. Some of the other ones a little, but not so much. Enterobacter has the highest rate uh, to become derepressed uh, when given these agents. And the agents we're talking about for AMC are beta-lactamases and cephalosporins. Um, when I see Enterobacter in the blood, I do start to get a little bit worried about AMC and I will move towards uh, a different agent a little quicker in those groups depending on the host from that standpoint. Now I will also say I can give you studies that cefepime works fine, zosin works fine, and carbapenems work fine in Enterobacter in the blood. Um, so it's not 100% absolute, but when I do see that, I do start to think about carbapenems with that. New antibiotics, some things you might see. Ceftotazo, which I'm sure many of you have uh, for resistant pseudomonas, that's the group I think about there. Ceftaz avi for drug-resistant re enterobacteriaceae, though it will cover pseudomonas, just not as reliably. Mirapenem babrobactam, another great drug. Cefidrocol, which is the new drug. We do have, it just got FDA approved a few months ago, has been used in house a little bit. And plazomycin uh, is another uh, new one that's not on the market just yet. Uh, Aravacycline and amatacycline are some other ones that we consider. Again, they're not available, but we can get them if we need them from our standpoint. So summary, always consider the four moments when prescribing antibiotics. Is an infection needs to be treated? Do we have the right diagnostics? Always be de-escalating. I think uh, when I was in residency, you know, we had these, these rules of Tinsley or whatnot, and one of them was always be discharging. 
I'm pretty sure y'all as hospitalists have that rule as well. I wanna add into always be discharging and always be de-escalating, uh, which would help out from that standpoint. And then a shorter duration, right? Shorter has been proven to be better. We don't need the standard 1421. Sometimes 10 days is fine, sometimes seven days is fine. Just shortening this duration up a little bit is going to help us out in the long run to keep us from worrying about resistance because we're smart, and but the bugs have numbers. Um, so if that's the issue, let us know. Now, uh, resistance happens fast, be the solution, not the cause. Little extra things here. Infectious diseases view. I don't know if all of y'all have seen this and if y'all went, you think back to the oncology viewer that was used to show you antibiotics and how long they've been on and when they were changed. This is a new one that came out. I hope y'all have seen it already, um, but it gives you exactly that. We've gone through and looked through all the antibiotics and told them it's the ones that we want within there. You have the temperature curve across, the, as you roll down, you have labs within that, you have imaging. I was hopeful that we would get lines in there. I can tell you the date the line was put in, but I can't tell you the full duration. So you can kind of use that to sort through. We use this on consults all the time. When did they start spiking fevers? When did they get better? What did the white count look like at this point in time? Just kind of gives you a big snapshot. I know as y'all change around so frequently, you know, they were taken care of, you know, by Dr. Smith and then Burkhart. And then, you know, Kevin Allen came in and gave him every damn antibiotic we got. Uh, and, and then you want to figure out what's going on after that. Um, this is a good way to kind of figure out those things from that standpoint. Um, also, when you click on this, there's this little thing called the Sanford Guide. I think a lot of y'all know the Sanford Guide. It's that little uh, book that's so pretty that Mike Sag is one of the editors of that a lot of us carry on to make us look smart. It is now available online. So if you click within the links to clinical apps on the side, there is the Sanford Guide. And UAB uh, has paid for, and we have available through some of the stewardship, but really UAB enterprise-wide, where you can get this on your phone as an app. Uh, my phone's right here. And then, uh, you know, nicely, you just click on the Sanford Guide, and then boom. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, well. Big bummer. Um, but you have it available for you within there. You can download it onto your phone, um, but in order to do that, to get access, you have to go through the UAB system. So when you click onto this, be sure you're at a UAB link computer, you register for it, and it'll send you a link to download it to get access to it on your phone. Once you get access, it's, it's yours. You don't have to be on a UAB network to use it. I use it at home all the time. One really nice part, um, and you'll see in this yellow circle over here, it has UAB. So that thing about antibiograms, we are actually moving our antibiograms into this resource. So if you say, hey, Josh, I saw you said um, something about, you know, efficium and VRE risk and then how often it's susceptible to ampicillin. You can go in here and you can look at that, right? You want to know how many of our Acinetobacter baumani are carbapenem resistant. You can go into that and look from that standpoint. And it just helps you out with the empirics and then puts it right at your finger so you can use it from that standpoint. I think it's super helpful and I use it a lot. Josh, um, we, have, and, we have one question. Somebody asked how you feel about the John Hopkins antibiotic guide. Um, I, I think they're all fine. I think um, both Sanford and Johns Hopkins uh, leave a lot to be desired in certain areas, but I think they're good places to start. They're not, you know, they're not clearly exactly the way that things are supposed to go. Just because you're seeing it that way and somebody's doing a little bit different doesn't mean that it's wrong. But I do think it's a good place to start and a good place um, if you really don't know where you're going or what's going on or something new. It's the thing to pick up uh, and look at. So I don't have a problem with either one. This one's just free. Um, I think we can get Hopkins through the School of Medicine, but I don't think you can get it as all clinical enterprise um, from that standpoint. This gives you the added benefit of having the antibiograms together within the library. Um, so here you go. Here's how to install it and do all that stuff. And then uh, questions, Woo, I think I did okay. Um, for set it and forget it at that point in time. Um, Anything to discuss, uh, anything over that, anything you want to talk about in the future, uh, let me know. Yeah, thank you, Josh, for your time. If anybody wants to just, um, you can either just ask a question, unmute yourself, or put a question in the chat. Either way, we'll be okay. Um, while we let them put questions in, Josh, anything that you've noticed, like since you do ID consults, any? 
any areas you think that we as a service could improve or things you see over and over to be good stewards? I mean, I, I think overall we're all pretty good stewards. And I can tell you being on, um, you know, the co-management system beforehand and, you know, once you see enough of these things, you actually get to the point where you all um, start to pick it up as well. And it's, you know, I can't tell you how many people I see with true uh, strep cellulitis or bilateral cellulitis or something. Otherwise, I, nobody gets called about that anymore. You know, those people are quickly switched to vancomycin to cefazolin and, you know, the other folks are just saying, you know what, this is not an infection and doesn't need to be treated. Um, I think overall, it's just identification and feeling comfortable with that. So I don't know if it's something that is a deficiency on y'all's end. It's just all of us getting better uh, with that. And I think everybody has. Um, urinary tract infections are always incredibly complicated. I do have a lecture for that. We can talk about the ins and outs. I tell people when I'm on service and Tinsley teams that Truly diagnosing a urinary tract infection in a hospitalized patient is probably the most difficult uh, diagnosis to make. The two things that everybody hedges on, the urine culture and the urinalysis, uh, in the patients that are in the hospital, they are usually always positive. I mean, all of these people are, are the highest risk for asymptomatic bacteria, so the urine culture is always going to be positive. The majority of these people have an AKI or some other kind of renal insult or a Foley in place that's going to make that UA positive. And I can't tell you how many times people just say dirty UA positive will initiate therapy. Um, and I can give you about four reasons why that's probably not a good idea. Uh, and then another 45 people who've been treated for that, that it did absolutely nothing for. So I think that's a space all of us, and that's ID included, uh, could probably do a better job of being at least a little bit more parsimonious. Um, I do recognize that that is difficult, and at the end of all that is to say, well, if you do decide to treat a urinary tract infection, don't treat it for, for 14 to 21 days. You know, five to seven is perfectly fine for cystitis. We're even talking about pilo, five to seven days, even when they have a bacteremia or a gram-negative bacteremia within that setting is perfectly fine. Um, so I think that's usually where, where we kind of lose um, a lot of our, I guess, stewardship style there. The other thing I would say is that we have these incredibly sick, complicated patients, and you all have seen all the COVID ones and everything else who are uh, about four disasters into too many disasters. Um, you know, some of those folks really probably don't need antibiotics. Um, and you've seen them where they've been on vinc and cefepine for 14 days. You've not grown anything out of their culture. Yes, they still have a fever and a leukocytosis, and they look pretty poor but I don't think those antibiotics are doing anything more at that point in time. And sometimes it's just okay to kind of reset the deck and say, you know what, they've had uh, sufficient therapy for any syndrome I could imagine this being, let's stop and see how they do. And oftentimes you will stop and they don't necessarily recrudesce or get worse. But the reality is, is that if they do, you start back over, let me get my cultures, get everything else again, and then you know we can, we can start afresh from that. So I think that's the space where I start to see uh, additional um, stewardship, not failures, but, but issues. Yeah, that was going to be my question was um, related to COVID because I've been pretty much trying not to start any of these patients on antibiotics. And I think Ashley may be able to identify this being med peds. We're much more comfortable with viral pneumonias. And so that idea of somebody coming in with that syndrome and not starting antibiotics is just a space that we maybe are a little bit more comfortable with. Um, but I've been surprised, I guess, and I don't know if it's the ICU's approach, just because if they're ICU sick, the idea is we just need to have them on coverage. But was just trying to get your sense of like, are there things that would make you say that these patients are appropriate for empiric antibiotics? Um, versus just kind of watching them to see how they do off of antibiotic therapy. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it's, it's just a hard situation. I mean, we have honestly so little to offer in those MICU COVID folks to say that we're doing something good for them. Um, you know, I think without a, a clear diagnostic culture and a clear syndrome that shows them worsening within that, I would probably hold antibiotics in the majority of these individuals. Um, now, that's to say that there is probably a risk of secondary bacterial infections in these individuals, um, but I would say that it's probably a lot less than we think and definitely a lot less than we treat. Um, the majority of infections, unfortunately, that I've seen in COVID persons have been 
hospital associated infections um, in them, whether it be um, you know, a central line infection, fungemia, intra-abdominal infection, some other kind of complication related to that. Those are the ones that we regularly see, but that's it's a little easier to define and treat um, within that. I will say that we are definitely starting to see, and I think it's because of this, much more resistant pathogens. Um, these people get put into the COVID unit and even our medical ICU, they're not used to having people in there for 14, 20, 21, you know, two month uh, stays and, and they definitely are. So these people are just building up these antibiotics. And one of the common problems that we have is, is the kind of false escalation of therapy uh, where we have a person who say comes in with COVID pneumonia and, and we say, you know what, I'm going to be not great. And I'm going to start them on Ceftriax on Azithro. And yeah, they had a fever and a leukocytosis. That fever came persistent. Their leukocytosis got worse or their vent settings got worse. And they're like, oh gosh, cefepime, you know, and then you're cefepime for seven days and nothing's gotten better. And you're, oh gosh, miropenem, right? So it just kind of, you escalate this stuff um, when you don't really have any reason to do such. And you have an excellent alternative explanation for their illness. It's just hard, I think, for some of us to say exactly what that is. Um, and and, and I, I grasp the difficulty, but I, I think we're, we're over-treating a lot of those people. And kudos to all you MedPeds folks for teaching us. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. Okay, do you have any other questions? Any other topics? I, th I think I think it's always helpful to do the UTI asymptomatic bacteria thing because I think it's probably the one that we go back and forth about and um, the ER oftentimes initiates therapy for even very marginal UA results and um, so I think it's, I think it's one that, and I think we've, it's been so ingrained that UTI and delirium, and I know that that's not bearing out as much in more recent data, but it's a hard thing to get away from. Um, so I think that would, that would be helpful. There was actually a study just published this week out of uh, some emergency, uh, journal looking at these individuals that got treated for having positive UA and the amount of overtreatment within this group is just astounding. And again, it's just our, our belief in what a positive UA is. And then also there's this kind of unfortunate intrinsic part of medicine is we got to give you a diagnosis. Um, and it's super easy to um, say, oh, you know, you have a urinary tract infection, here's your antibiotics, go home. Um, and it's really easy sometimes with some of these people, especially in our ED to say, man, this person has got something going on. I got no damn idea what it is, but that UA is positive and I can at least get them up to the hospital service with a positive UA and a urinary tract infection. Um, and that's often what happens. And I think it's kind of y'all's job uh, kind of afterwards to say, you know what, I see what you're doing there. Um, and I get it. And this is a complicated person. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to continue to treat therapy for this urinary tract infection. One thing that, that I'm sure you'll y'all definitely see afterwards is <laughs> the person that presents to the ED and says, every time this happens, it is a urinary tract infection. And it's because every time they come in, we get a UA and we tell them it's a urinary tract infection, when in reality it's not. So we're not really doing ourselves a, a favor in these frequent flyers or these kind of, um, you know, ill with everything kind of individuals to tell them that it's urinary tract infection because they believe it because um, it gets them admitted. Well, and you alluded to it too, but I think the indwelling catheter patients, because those are, you know, we have several of them that end up at Highlands that have had the sepsis in the ICU. And so distinguished, you know, knowing that they're all colonized, I think sometimes it gets very complicated deciding you know, is whatever random symptom they came in with actually related to this UA that I know is going to look atrocious every time they come in. And so many of them are spinal cord patients too. So I think there's a dysautonomia element of it that fakes this, you know, it's hard to differentiate. Is this, are they hypotensive because they're septic or are they hypotensive because they're a spinal cord patient and that just happens to them sometimes. 
Um, so I think that's a that's been a particularly difficult population for me personally to step away from doing empiric antibiotics, even though I know there's a colonization issue with them. And, and you know, I, I think that's absolutely you've got the that person in septic shock and a fever, right? Like, okay, you know, there's no no discussion. But if you got someone who comes in with a little hypotension, um, you know, you, you you can definitely give them a little bit of fluid and just see what happens, right? You can say, you know, maybe maybe this is an infection, but I'm not sure. Um, and yes, there is a lot of argument about the, the delay um, of, and, and I see Justin down there, um, who, who I'm sure is going to cuss me on the sepsis part, but I think a lot of this are trying to sort out what this looks like is, you know, what is the risk of the delay of, of these antibiotics versus what is, you know, the risk of giving these antibiotics in a situation where they don't necessarily belong. Um, so I, I think it's a hard thing to sort out. And I, I you know, I think sepsis is, is very important. We need to treat it. But I think uh, we, in some instances, put the cart before the horse um, with the use of these antibiotics uh, earlier um, when in a situation sometimes maybe, maybe we could wait a little while before that happens. And then of course you got beautiful babies on there, so always good. Okay, well I think if that's all of our questions, Josh, we appreciate your time. Thank you to everybody for tuning in on Monday. We will definitely have you back for some other topics. And yeah. we appreciate you again. Glad to thank you as well. And if, if you have any feedback or any recommendations, uh, we can take the show on the road, but uh definitely don't want to be as bad this time as it is it will be in the future. Our, yeah, you know what I mean. Anyway, <laughs> thank y'all. All right. Thank you guys. Have a great evening.